Hello and welcome to the second episode of this format. This time I'll also talk about a few subreddits with a few very interesting users and posts. Since this format will only include reddit topics, you can make suggestions for future episodes by posting on my subreddit. If you end up enjoying this video, please make sure to sub to the channel and maybe leave a like and comment. Let's start with topic 1. Now, this is a subreddit that I stumbled upon while doing research on the user Cash22. The subreddit Obsessive Love is full of disturbing individuals. While they aren't on par with Cash22's posts, they still are definitely unsettling. The subreddit contains a description. It reads, This is a subreddit dedicated to Yandere content, mostly stories from personal experiences or just casual conversations. And due to the fractured nature of the Yandere community as a whole, this place is meant to serve as a safe haven for both the tamest and the most extreme yandere's out there. They also have rules and one of them is definitely odd. The second rule reads, keep it legal. While this might be a subreddit for obsessive people, murder and abuse is still illegal. While I personally might not shun you for it, the police will disagree. And getting into legal trouble is a prime way to get the community shut down by reddit. With a moderator like this, you can probably imagine which type of individuals they will attract. Let's take a look at a few posts. This first one reads, What can I do? So I've been thinking and like, do you guys have any methods on getting their attention? Without illegality. Last time I tried, I donated to their Patreon only for them to remove my pledge like a sissy. Then again, I said something kinda alarming so that was my fault there. But what else can I do? Try to contact their followers? I have nudes of them. Should I send him the nudes? Or should I send mine? Because I've done that and that usually gets him interested. I know his dad and mommy's info too, like all of his information. I don't want to do anything mean, but at the same time, I like seeing him all flustered and annoyed by my little antics. It's like I'm his antagonist, a cartoon anti-hero type deal. He's so cute, I just want to cuddle him to bake him bits and tease him. I like being a menace, it's been like what, four years now? since 2017. That's how long I've been attached to him. Others on the sub express how hard it is to deal with this mindset. One user writes, being obsessive isn't a face. So I was listening to some yandere obsessive love songs in a playlist my boyfriend made for me. I started looking at the comments and I noticed an alarming amount of people who commented things like, throw back to my middle school yandere face, yikes. Or, I used to listen to this and actually pretend I was a yandere, cringe. While I understand that younger people want to be like the things and characters they find interesting, it also really upsets me to see that the way I am and the part of myself I've been studying for years can be grouped in with people who experience it as a simple face. And then there's also the whole topic of romanticizing mental illness as well with this, how it's seen as cute to be crazy and obsessive. I don't know, it just very much upsets me that something I mentally struggle with every day that can be extremely debilitating on my mental and physical health is just seen as a face to a huge group of people. It makes sense. Certain people are afraid of losing their partner, which makes them obsessed over the idea of not losing them, doing what's necessary to keep them. While this is an understandable thought process, a few people take these to the extreme end. Constantly cyberstalking your beloved, being fueled by jealousy and anger if a different person approaches them and so on. Other posts on this sub are mostly of people venting about how much they love a certain individual, which doesn't seem too bad on the surface. However, one individual is definitely more disturbing than the rest. They go by Corruption Fan. While their account got banned within 24 hours, I managed to screen grab a few of their posts. The first one reads, I have a strong urge to R-word my beloved so they know that, the rest of the time, I'm so nice to them compared to how I could be so they both don't want to leave me because they are scared it will happen again and because they know how much I could protect them if they know I'm capable of that. That's obviously a very disturbing thought process. In the next one, the person shares the following. I want to hire my beloved once they start looking for a job and move them in with me when they start looking for a house. This way there won't be anyone in their life above me and I can have their cuteness to myself and they'll do whatever I say. They are so adorable to me and I think about this so much. Now they made even more posts but I can't read them out due to their sensitive nature. I mean corruption fan got banned within 24 hours for a reason. This subreddit is very similar to a different one called R Yandere but obsessive love seems to be less moderated.
This one is a very interesting post. It starts off slow, but it definitely is one of the most interesting posts I've read so far. It has a crazy backstory and is highly authentic. There are even multiple news coverages about the situation. It comes from the user Ravenously Red. Their post reads, I had this friend who was really into the occult. Unfortunately, I was the person who got him into it. We had a mutual appreciation of the paranormal and all things weird, so I thought the subject would interest him. He started going deep into the subject to the point where he wouldn't talk about anything else. He would actually interrupt a conversation and force the subject back to occult matters. Rude, but sometimes people go through phases where their interest is all they want to talk about. It was a mostly forgivable offense. I think I should mention that this friend didn't have a big social circle. His depression and introverted nature kept him inside a lot. He didn't have the best luck in relationships with women. His world was kinda small, and I did enjoy hanging out with him, so I did my best to be a good friend. I didn't want to just brush him off because he was acting a little weirder than normal. Things started to go downhill when he started to smoke DMT. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the substance, when you smoke it, you get transported to a different world. An entirely new plane of existence. Your body and yourself don't exist anymore. You're just exploring this alternate reality dreamscape. People see all kinds of different things there. Imagine what that does to a person when they are smoking it 30 plus times a day. Apparently, he had hour-long conversation with entities in his bedroom even when he wasn't smoking DMT. Of course, I was very alarmed to hear all of this, and I told him he needed to take a serious break. No substances at all for a few months, so he can find solid footing in reality again. At this point, I was still hanging out with him because he obviously needed some help, and like I said before, he didn't have a lot of friends. He was also the black sheep of the family, and so I knew he wasn't getting any kind of support from them. He was really close to his sister, and I did reach out to her on Facebook to express my concerns. I pushed her to talk him into getting some psychiatric help, because he was slipping past the point of no return. I'm not really sure if she took my messages seriously, since we didn't really know each other. And plus, she's at least six years younger than us, and possibly didn't grasp how serious the situation was becoming. In any case, I'll jump forward now to the part where things start to get really creepy. My boyfriend had made arrangements to hang out with our friend at the park. I didn't really want to go because I felt like I need a break from him and his nonsensical ranting. I just couldn't deal with it on that particular day. My boyfriend said he wasn't all that bad and we went anyway. We get to the park and he is his usual self. Ranting about Egypt and made up gods that only he knew the truth about etc. He also had his large hunting knife that he kept fiddling with the whole time we were on a walk. He told us that he had been using it in ceremonial magic and that it helped him to banish negative thoughts. It made me extremely uneasy. He would do this thing where he would take the knife and make stabbing motions near his heart or head, like he was mock stabbing himself, all while holding a conversation with me or my boyfriend. I think we were both really on edge and didn't know what to say or do about it. I tried to distract him from doing it by bringing up other subjects that might interest him, but he kept on with his ritual. Keep in mind, we were walking on a trail, so it wasn't like we could just say goodbye then and there. We had to walk back to our car and drop him off at his car. My boyfriend had the bright idea that we should get some lunch after our walk, even though I was doing my best to give him a look that said, why do you think I want to spend any more time with this nut? But it must have not been very effective, or my boyfriend was ignoring it. Either way, we ended up getting in the car to get lunch. In the car I was driving, my boyfriend was in the passenger seat and our weirdo friend was in the back. As we are heading through a busy part of town, where all the shopping and restaurants are, I hear the distinctive sound of a belt buckle coming undone. Then I hear the worst sound imaginable. I peek back out of the corner of my eye and my suspicions were confirmed. He was full on jacking off in our back seat. I mean pants all the way down, bare ass on the seat. Beating it so hard, it was like he wanted to rip it off. Instantly, I felt sick to my stomach, and all the nervous energy I had throughout the day popped up into my head. I was trying not to shake and trying to ignore it and drive through a heavy traffic. I kind of had a freeze response, I guess. The whole time, I kept thinking about that huge knife he had in his pocket, and obviously was completely off his rocker now. I was afraid to say anything or confront him because I didn't know how he was going to react. This part is nuts, but my boyfriend didn't seem to notice, and the whole time he kept rambling on about god knows what. I couldn't listen because my thoughts were 100% focused on driving and trying to act like I didn't know what was going on in my back seat. We get to the restaurant and my boyfriend runs inside to grab food. 
I'm left alone in the car with our friend, and I try to act like I'm browsing on my phone, when really I'm watching and listening as hard as I can. We don't talk. My boyfriend gets back and I complain that I'm tired. It's been a long day. Let's drop him off, etc. And so I drive us back to our friend's car, and he doesn't get out of our vehicle. He just sits there. I have to get a little bit rude and ask him to please get out and go home. He gets out of our car and walks over to his passenger side. I start getting really scared and I suspected the worst. He pulled a gun out of some kind of bag he had on the seat and he just walks over to our car with it. I don't know why I did this, but I was so pissed and I just got out of my car and walked right up to him. I was maybe 3 foot away and could see it was loaded. I kept asking him over and over, what are you doing? Because apparently that's all my brain could think to do. I told him to get in his car and go home. He never said anything during this whole time. He just kind of cried and had this wild look in his eye. For whatever reason, he got back into his car and drove off. I told my boyfriend obviously we are never hanging out with him again and that I didn't even want him to talk to him anymore. A few months pass and he occasionally messages me through the PlayStation or texts my phone. He says a lot of random stuff and I just ignore it. It turns out he moved down to Tennessee near Nashville. I don't know why. He had a roommate and I think their girlfriend lived there. I'm not really sure about the situation. I think maybe he's turning his life around and getting a fresh start down there. I think it's best to cut all contact and let him regroup. I'm not interested in any kind of friendship with him and I know he needed help beyond what I could offer. Again, I reached out to his sister and let her know that he had a weapon. She managed to get it from him somehow, but it did little good in the end. I get a call around 11pm one night that wakes me up. It's a man claiming he's a detective down in Gallatin, Tennessee and my heart skips a beat. I start sweating and immediately ask what happened. Apparently my former friend took someone's life on Halloween day. I don't know all the details and the articles about it are kind of sparse. The whole thing is really surreal and I'm just feeling like I'm lucky that I didn't get shot last summer. This whole thing turned out way longer than I expected but that's the story. After this post, someone shared a link to an article and OP confirmed that this person was indeed the person she talked about in the post. According to the news article, the suspect is 28-year-old Coley Butcher and he has been charged with criminal homicide following a fatal stabbing on Peninsula Drive in Gallatin, Tennessee. The victim was his own roommate. Interestingly, there is almost no information or background story on Cody from official sources. So it's even more interesting to have a Redditor sharing a first-hand experience with the perpetrator. This post is definitely one of the most interesting ones I've read, especially considering the authentic nature of it. Obviously, there's no way to tell for sure if the Reddit user said the 100% truth, but considering everything else, it seems highly authentic and real. This continence is a very cryptic subreddit. Most posts come from a user called Sam of Eclia. He goes by Sam. The subreddit description reads, for higher knowledge, an unheard subject worlds found. This is a place where one can share their world or worlds as subjects, unheard of elsewhere, where they aren't related in topic, as a place to advertise and access newly forming subjects. However, myself as creator, I also provide tools, these for coming up with your own new world subjects, or other, and general innovations of topic. It is recommended to switch to new posts on viewing, popularity is misleading as top discovery. Well, while he says a top discovery is misleading, the most upvoted post comes from himself. It says, Before I smoke my sperm mixed with salt, bong water and sugar, I tried just heating it with a torn. My sperm in disapproval decided to break my thick glass cup on its own as it burned up. But after I explained it to them, they understood and did not break my pipe, because they knew I did love him. Attaches a picture of what he just described, but I think I cannot show it here. Anyway, he added a bit more in the comments. It reads, I told them that they had to find a way to get back into my body from there because life is really hard and it can get you like that. So you better be ready to survive it. Plus, I damn well bet when the remains of the other sperm get to my bolts, the other sperm will hopefully start to get suspicious enough to prepare just in case. If not, they might not even make it. Cause what if I masturbated that day? They have to get back into my bolts that time or they're screwed, aren't they? So this teaches my sperm that life is hard and to adapt to survive. So they'll be ready for the years after now that are even more risky and dangerous than today. The issue with Sam is that he oftentimes responds to posts that are being made in a subreddit in a very uncommon way. He seems to have a hard time having a coherent discussion. 
Overall, sometimes Sam's behavior gets people worried. Here for instance, someone made a post asking if he's okay. His response reads as follows. Nah, I'm fine. I just feel like they are starving the poor because they didn't have the free meal place open for them today in my city. So now the government is risking its own demise at the fate of what it did to itself. For not respecting the way that lets it live. It's cause they are not letting people eat anymore. It is because they are not doing their job anymore. They are trying to steal it from others, and so they are gonna be left not owning any of it anymore. If they just keep trying to starve the poor to have more money for themselves, because there is a limit to how much you can manage to take away from people before they snap. That's why people are getting their lives taken away on the streets as we speak. As you can see, OP doesn't even understand as to what Sam replied to exactly. Someone also adds that Sam doesn't really seem to be all there when he replies to people. While this reply just seems a bit random, he has numerous replies which make no sense at all. Honestly, just go over to the subreddit and read through a few posts and replies. It's actually crazy how detailed his responses are to the most mundane questions. If you head over there, don't forget to stay respectful and don't harass anyone. This one is from two years ago and was shared by a user called Staring Void on the Let's Not Meet subreddit. What this user details in their post is really terrifying. Their post reads, Someone broke into my house and tried to find me. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no streetlights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around that house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later, was sure that I had heard noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark and this particular phone was so bright I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9 something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in and a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bathroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down in the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank god he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic, but my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bathroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather, who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put in a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The men in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. 
I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet, and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped over my bed. I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my bedroom until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all the books, pictures and knickknacks out of my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the box and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line, along with some foil and an empty pen tube which the police said people often use to smoke substances, so they think he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get the door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without any incidents. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved. Except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet, instead of the attic. I try not to think about what could have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. Honestly, this sounds more like a good story than a real one, so take this entire thing with a grain of salt. I'm not saying that this entire thing is completely unrealistic, but it just reads like a good story you'd find in a book. In the replies he added that he never heard back from the police and that they might have not even bothered taking fingerprints. The theory that the perpetrator might be an addict was thrown around multiple times by other editors and also by OP himself, but there's obviously no proof for that. Hey, if you've made it this far, thanks a lot for watching. If you haven't subbed to the channel yet, make sure to do so. Before ending this off, I want to quickly thank the patrons. First off, I want to thank the elite tier patrons which consist of 44, Clip Artisan, Connor Thanel, Courtney O'Colt, Krebs Ugen, Dave Birkins, Electrocat, Illy Bueno, Ian Wenkmer, Foster Bradley, I Love the Second Amendment, James Baker, Jamie, Kirsten Patricio, Lord of the Lizards, Madeline Tanner, Morgok C, Rick, NXT Equal, Santino Sierra, Shawnee, and Spooky Dool Set. Thanks a lot to the Legend Tier patrons, which consist of Amy Stringfellow, Andrew906, Austin, Bodie, Brian Cave, Brianna Schaff, Cameron Mischett, Cassandra, Christopher, Dark Nolol, Dennis Greasefire, Digital Capybara, Evie Meyer, Jeb, Lige Andromeda, Maria Schoenberger, Malcolm Mart, MG, Newcastle, Riley Bear, and Vladislav Korshevi. Thanks to every other patron in the supporter tier, I really appreciate that. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.